say, if your only tool is a hammer, every problem starts to look like a nail. So, what if the only tool you have is a complex, high-speed 32-bit processor? Does all of your software start to look like a nail? No. Wait. I think I mixed something up there. Anyway, my point is, many of today's applications need more than one kind of processor. You've got some tasks that need the big hammer, of course. And a fast applications processor is great for those. But what about control, real-time tasks, or things that need to use very little power? You know, MCU stuff? Wouldn't it be nice if our applications processor came with more than just a hammer? Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk, and today I'm pretty excited. My guest is Amanda McGregor from Freescale, and we're going to look at a new heterogeneous applications processor from Freescale that has both an ARM Cortex-A9 applications processor and a Cortex-M4 microcontroller. Because my whole application isn't just a nail. Before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find out even more information about the IMX6 Solo X, Freescale's new heterogeneous multi-core applications processor. Hi, Amanda. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Amelia. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So a lot of applications like IoT require stuff like fancy user interfaces. But at the same time, we still have the need for a lot of functions that a good old MCU can do. Are you seeing the same thing? We are. We see many users that are attempting to run multiple execution environments within a single system. As you mentioned, they do want the feature-rich, fancy user interface, but these types of IoT devices are requiring constant connectivity. They need to connect to various sensors within a system to get environmental data. Yeah. So there are needs to have multiple execution environments to both run the UI and collect the various types of data that are coming into the system. Mm -hmm. We also see users needing multiple execution environments for guaranteed real-time performance. Uh -huh. as well as maintaining a high level of system security between the two different execution environments and power consumption. By having two different independent environments, there are benefits that can be realized in terms of low power. So you mentioned security. Now, certainly that and isolation are important for IoT applications, but what specific types of applications do you see this being the most important for? Certainly automotive, a lot of the telematics and vehicle to vehicle connectivity is a primary area for these types of applications. Makes sense. Smart devices in the home, home automation, we're having more and more devices be connected in the home and we're all very sensitive about our devices being connected in the home in terms of security and securing sure. our data and the information that's being presented out to the cloud. So in terms of security, you know, in the home, we're looking at devices that are connected like thermostats, motion sensors, video surveillance, even a wireless light bulb uh -huh. would be an example. So there are many applications within the home. And let's not also forget industrial applications as well. Sure. There's quite a lot in terms of factory automation and robotics that are also very heavy users of collecting data from sensors and need to do that in a secure way as well. So there must be several different ways to address this problem, right? There are. So you have a traditional multi-chip solution where you would have a separate MPU and MCU. Uh -huh. They would each run completely in isolation. The MPU would control the UI, run the feature-rich, application-rich operating system. The MCU would be available to connect to sensors, be the sensor hub, provide the real-time responsiveness. It does give you the strict separation, but there is significant overhead. There's additional bomb cost, bill of materials cost. Sure. There's also more complexities in the way that the two subsystems need to communicate. That definitely is a disadvantage there. You could run a virtualization with a hypervisor if you have a dual core solution. In that case, you could run you know, the same operating system on both cores. You could run a hypervisor to have a separate execution environment on one of the cores. This does give you a little bit more flexibility in being able to more dynamically allocate tasks between the two cores. Oh, okay. But it tends to be pretty power hungry. It's going to 
consume more power. There is some performance impact. The real-time responsiveness is perhaps not adequate in some cases. Mm, okay. But it is a second method of achieving that type of system. The third method is heterogeneous multiprocessing, and that's where you effectively embed an MCU functionality into a traditional MPU-like okay. architecture. And in that way, you can more efficiently share all of the resources within the system on chip. You don't need to duplicate resources within a combined bill of materials. Yeah. You can have the potential to improve some energy efficiency. The interprocessor communication is quicker, more efficient because the cores are communicating within the same architecture. But the disadvantage in that case is that, okay, now that you can share resources within the system, how do you do that in a safe and secure way? Right. Yeah. So we're here at Freescale, and I'm going to assume that you guys have a solution for this. So Amanda, what do you got for me? Yes, we do. So we have what we call our IMX6 SoloX applications processor. Okay. It is our first heterogeneous device that oh. embeds a Cortex M4 with a Cortex A9 into a single chip solution. Cool. Okay. So it does give the higher performance that you get with the Cortex A9. And you have the real-time responsiveness available through the Cortex-M4. And the combined heterogeneous architecture gives you the ability to run the multiple execution environments. And it also has several advantages in terms of low power as well. Cool. Now, IMX6 SoloX also has other features like device level security, which is really important for securing the IoT. And part of that is this resource domain controller, mm. which helps to efficiently share the resources between the two cores in a secure way. Okay. The SoloX has multiple device options, packages, graphics enablement to really give you multiple choices as a user to fit the right product to your design. Nice. And then we also provide a full list of board support packages and development tools to help you get started. Very cool. So you guys have other i.mx devices. So where does the 6 Solo X fit in there? So we do have the IMX6 series and it consists of now six families. The IMX6 Solo X is considered one family. So one family out of six total families in IMX6 series. So it's a standalone family of products. It has its own set of packages, its own features. It's not pin compatible with other families in the IMX6 series, yet it does maintain a large amount of software compatibility. Okay. So what does the 6 Solo X bring to the party? It does bring the heterogeneous multiprocessing with the addition of the Cortex M4. We have a dual gigabit ethernet capability on the chip, which is brand new to IMX. Cool. And what we've also added in the gigabit ethernet controller is the ability to do AVB or audio video bridging for quality of service. Okay. I um, mean, we've added some unique hardware to provide traffic shaping and prioritization to assist with AVB. We also have PCI Express. Now this isn't a unique feature in IMX 6 Solo X. It does exist in other families within IMX6 series, but we are seeing much more kind of market uptake for PCI Express as we're moving to higher speed wireless connectivity. Mm -hmm. So it's becoming almost a mandatory requirement in many of these connected devices. So we do have that on IMX6 Solo X and we have a right sized 2D, 3D graphics unit as well to give you, you know, we talked about needing that rich user interface. Well, a 2D and 3D unit is going to help you achieve more of a realistic user interface for your customer. Okay, so Amanda, can I assume that this is available in several different packages? Yes, we have three different package sizes available for the IMX6 Solo X, depending on if you're optimizing to a smaller form factor, if you're more cost sensitive, or if you need all of the features available on the chip. Gotcha. We have different features available on different versions of the package. And all packages are offered in automotive, industrial, and consumer versions. And that's important because they each have different requirements. Mm -hmm. Temperature requirements, operating lifetime requirements, for example, industrial is typically always on for 10 plus years of operation. Mm -hmm. Automotive is typically a hotter environment. So you need a processor that can run up to higher temperatures. Yeah. So each package option has a version for consumer, automotive, and industrial. Ah, okay. So can we take a look under the hood and see what's inside? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously the key part of the chip is the multi-core system that we have, the Cortex-A9 plus the Cortex-M4. Being able to efficiently communicate between the two cores, we have a messaging unit that allows for interprocessor communication. And we have the resource domain controller to allow efficient, safe and secure sharing of the resources on the chip. We have dual gigabit ethernet with hardware AVB support. We have both ports gigabit ethernet capable. 
We have the Mac integrated, so you would use an external FI and switch in your system if you need both ports available. We do have hardware support for traffic shaping and prioritization, so we can meet the constraints of AVB okay. for quality of service. We have PCIe for high-speed Wi-Fi connectivity. As we're moving to higher-speed Wi-Fi, like 802.11ac and beyond, you need more bandwidth than a traditional SDIO-based interface. So PCIe gives an an option to the user who needs to have higher-speed Wi-Fi. Gotcha. We have multiple display options. So every device has at least a parallel display. Okay. If you need a larger resolution display, we have LVDS interfaces available on on some of the package options. We have the option to add 2D and 3D graphics acceleration. If you have a user interface that's really going to benefit from rotation or bit blitz Mm. or OpenGLES, we have a 2D and 3D unit to help you get there. In terms of memory support, we have low power DDR2 as well as DDR3. Again, similar to how we talked about the different package options for cost optimized or size optimized. LPDDR2 is optimized for power. Mm. DDR3 is more cost optimized. So we have multiple options there. We have versatile boot options with high assurance boot available on all devices. And we have some analog integration for some of the power management, which helps to simplify the overall system. So I'm intrigued by this RDC part. Can we take a closer look at that? Absolutely. The resource domain controller is a, it's a new module integrated into IMX. And largely it was developed because of the challenges with heterogeneous multiprocessing mm-hmm. and being able to safely and securely share resources within the system. The resource domain controller is a fully programmable model or a fully programmable engine that allows you to set up multiple domains within the system on chip and allocate peripherals to either one domain or to multiple domains. Oh, okay. This is usually achieved at boot time in a secure mode. Okay. So the RDC is programmed only when you're in a secure mode and usually at boot time. You're not making these types of dynamic peripheral allocations on the fly. It's usually predetermined. Yeah. So you do it in a secure mode at boot time. But again, it's fully programmable. So you have the ultimate flexibility to be able to reapply resources depending on the system configuration. In addition to the full programmable aspect to the RDC, there are also hardware semaphores embedded in the overall architecture. And that's really important to ensure that when one of the domains is accessing a peripheral or a shared memory region, that its access is guaranteed and locked so that Mm -hmm. another domain can't come in and modify while that previous domain is trying to access and and write to that particular peripheral. So it goes hand in hand. We have the full programming model of the RDC and hardware enforced semaphores for the protection mechanism. Okay, so Amanda, how does this fit into the overall system security picture? So the resource domain controller is one of the main pillars of security for IMX6 SoloX. It's essential to the heterogeneous multi-core approach that we've developed with IMX6 SoloX. So it's definitely one of the key pillars. We've also carried forward our high assurance boot to make sure that the boot image that runs on the device at boot time is intended to run on that device. So Mm -hmm. we do have some tools to help you unlock that feature if you decide to run a trusted boot on that device. We also have an ability to store secure data on chip. And then we have tamper detect pins so that if there's a, a malicious attack made on that device, the secure data can be erased cool, instantaneously. Okay. And then we have a variety of other security features like crypto accelerators and random number generators as well. All right. So it seems like one of the advantages in having a heterogeneous system like this is the ability to save power. Now, how do we manage our power consumption with this device? So with the two cores that we have, if you think about it, many times the Cortex-A9 doesn't need to be active. For example, if you're just maintaining a connection or monitoring some sensors or gathering some data, The Cortex-A9 doesn't necessarily need to be invoked to run the user interface. There's a lot of background tasks that can be happening. Yeah. So in that case, having a way to power gate the Cortex-A9 is going to save you significant amounts of power. So the way we've architected our system is to completely separate the Cortex-A9 and the Cortex-M4 power domain so that they can be operated and gated independently. Ah. So that's really important to what we call this smart system power. So just providing the architectural hooks to allow you to fully shut down the Cortex-A9 and keep the Cortex-M4 running. And, you know, you still get some benefits of pretty decent 
task level management and processing on the Cortex M4. However, when you do need to invoke the Cortex A9, it can come up very quickly and you can get the full capabilities of the chip. Okay. We also have the ability to power gate the GPU and the display domains as well, depending on if you need access to those particular features of the chip. So all in all, we've created a novel way of architecting the power domains on this chip to really give the maximal flexibility in the usage at lowest power. All right, so I've designed your six Solo X into my system, but my product is going to need to ship for the next seven years. Is that still going to be okay? Yeah, so we at Freescale have a product longevity program for the different market segments that we serve. Typically 10 or 15 year minimum supply commitment. Wow. IMX6 Solo X being an industrial and automotive product does bring with it the 10 and 15 year longevity from Freescale. Very cool. So that's a great advantage for you designing your product. In addition to the product longevity program, we also have an energy efficiency program. We know that users are typically more concerned than ever about low power. Yeah. And we give an energy mark to certain Freescale products that meet low power criteria. And so IMX6 Solo X is one of those energy efficient products from Freescale. Very cool. Okay. So with an SOC, I know I'm buying a lot more than just a chip, but what does the development and support environment look like? We have multiple aspects to the enablement for IMX6 Solo X. So we have, if you look at the evaluation board, first and foremost, usually you would get started with a development platform. Freescale does offer a full Sabre smart devices board based okay. on IMX6 Solo X. On this board, we have our Freescale PMIC. So you can see an example layout with a power management IC, which will help you to leverage the lowest power available on the device. Okay. We have CAN IO, we have PCI Express, we have multiple gigabit ethernet, we have DDR3, we have multiple display options on the board. So you really do have access to majority of the features on the SOC. In addition, we do provide those design files for the development board. So you could use that as a starting point for your own design. Okay. So we do provide those as part of the package as well. We also have a full software package available from Freescale. We have board support packages for Linux and Android. Oh, okay. For the Cortex A9, we have MQX for Cortex M4. So Freescale does provide the board support packages for the Sabre development platform. In addition to the BSPs, we also have audio codecs, we have a manufacturing tool which helps you with device level flash programming. Very important. We have code signing tools to help you with implementing high assurance boot. And we have our processor expert tool to help you with navigating through the complexities of the pin mux That's of good. the IMX6 Solo X. So that is also available. And then we have our broad ecosystem. We have a variety of different embedded board solutions out there from various vendors, different tool chains, other software is available. For example, FreeRTOS. We have design services and system integrators as well. So we have a very broad ecosystem for IMX6 Solo X. Excellent. Well, I think I'm ready to get started. Uh, where do I go from here? So we have silicon tools and software are now fully available. Excellent. Well, I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Amanda. Thank you for having me. And before we go, don't forget to click that link. There you can find out more information about the IMX6 Solo X, Freescale's new heterogeneous multi-core applications processor. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from EE Journal. For more Chalk Talks, you can check out the on-demand section of eejournal.com or head on over to YouTube, keyword EE Journal.